Okay, so um, my name's Scott Manley, this is uh, Simon Hope, and so we're from Geoplex. You'll, you'll know me, but you won't know Simon, and there's, an, there's a couple of other Geoplex uh, employees here tonight as well that are newcomers. So uh, we're, we're basically a geospatial consultancy, so we're here tonight to talk about we, we all have built apps with probably a mapping control in using, using MapKit as iOS developers, but really this presentation is about <coughs> how we can go beyond that, and that's really what our company specialises in, we, is uh, geospatial solutions where you're using custom map data, you're looking for complex map solutions like offline solutions, that type of thing, and so uh, really that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We get a warning at right up front. This is going to be an Xcode free zone, primarily because uh, uh, Simon and uh, and others here that are really not Xcode developers. What we're what we're doing is talking a bit about some of the background <coughs> to some of these technologies and uh, capabilities, and why this is a complex and um, and unique area in its own right. So you've got the opportunity to leave uh, <laughs> if. Uh, if you want. Here's, here's what we're talking about tonight. Basically, an issue, kick off with some challenges to spatial data, why this is a bit different to the sort of data that we're traditionally working with in, uh, in an iOS app, how we deliver that in an effective way, spatial services, so going beyond data and looking at how we can visualise and, and, uh, and analyse spatial data, and then obviously the challenges of, of going offline. Thanks. Um, so, so like, I, 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 I total admission, right? I, I don't know anything about iOS. So I could write it on the back of a postage stamp. Pretty much what I know. Um, I know a bit about, like, hey. Can you spell it? Nah, nah. <laughs> um, but I know something about my dad's toolbox, right? And I don't know if your dad. It's like my dad, right? But when I go to his toolbox, it's just grim in there, right? And there's like loads of, you know, there's, you know, there's a nut and a bolt, and a nut and a bolt won't go together. There's a bit of a washer, and that, that to me is like my world, right? So when I get given like spatial data to do, to do a job, I get given like a rusty old bolt, something over here and something over there, and you've got to try and sort of munch it all together. So spatial data is a bit like my. Dad's toolbox. It comes in all these different formats. It comes from different organisations. It comes from different people who use different sort of vendor software, and you kind of have to get it in to the same format. The other problem with it is, is um, it's the world's not one system, right? You, you, I know, like you guys might be like mapping stuff, and you've got like an X and a Y column, right? But my world, unfortunately, is not as simple as that X and the Y column. This is a, um, a, a map or projection that was developed by Book, Bookmeister Fuller. Um, it's called the Dymaxion projection. Um, I guess I might, I guess I should explain a little bit what, what a projection is, right? Like the, the, the world's round, and when you want to put it on a flat surface, you've got to peel the orange and spread the orange out. Um, and when you do that, things start getting fucked up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, now, I, 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 like, like I like Bookmeister Fuller's map, right? I, I, it's a great map. It's the sort of thing I, you know, I would like on my wall at home. I really don't understand what was going through Bookmeister Fuller's head when he created this projection. But this is a projection, and the world's full of these different projections. And when we get data from different organisations, especially like um, in a country like Australia, then we're often dealing with organisations that are supplying data not in lat long, but in different local projections. And we have to move that data between projections to get it into the same format. And like in the, in the, in the consumer world, you don't really have that problem, but in some of the worlds that we work in, we do. Um, and if you don't get it right, you can be rooted, right? So if you're gonna do like, you know, measurement in an emergency context or in a defense context, then if you don't get that projection stuff right, you can really sort of end up in sort of in front of committees in, in, in various places like Canberra. So, uh, so we've got a bag of bits and pieces and projections, and it's, it's a bit dirty. Um, so we've got this world of spatial data, and, and it, then, then we have this problem of like, how do we deliver it? Like, you know, how do we get it across the web? Um, and like, Prior to 2005, does anyone have a fixie? Come on, I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's fucking not only one fixie owner in this, this room. Like 
<laughs> right, right, right. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, right. All right. So, like, before 2005, we delivered maps online in an a la carte fashion, right? So you'd make a request to a GIS server or a map server, and you'd say, I want a map. I want it to have these layers in it. Um, and I want this layer to be pink and this layer to be green. And you'd end up with this sort of result, right? You get a really, really ugly map, and it was very, very slow to produce, right? So it's like, you know, give me a map for this bounding box, and then give me it again for this bounding box. And it was horrific. So it is, but it was kind of a la carte, you know, you could just do maps to order. And then 2005, we got the introduction of the Mac map, right? <laughs> so thanks to Google, um, you know, the world became one universal bland map, right? And we have a lot to thank, thank them for, you know, like the ubiquity of mapping now is all thanks to what Google did. Um, and, and everyone sort of got that experience with, you know, tiles, 256 by 256 tiles, very, very slippy, you know, seamless process, and it was, you know, it was a radical sort of disruptive change to the industry. Now, I guess, today we've got this, in a way, we've got a best of both worlds. So um, we can order this tiled map quickly, um, but we can sort of change it as well, which is quite cool. So on the left-hand side is a, is a company from the UK called CloudMade. Um, and on the right-hand side is a company from the US called Mapbox. Uh, they bro both, both provide tiles, but you can change those tiles. You can order them, in, or, or you, can, you can, I mean, this, this one on the left-hand side is um, called Midnight Marauder. I quite like that. Um, so it's quite good for, if you want to show, like you want to have a map of salubrious sort of um, venues for the, uh, for the evening, <laughs> then I suggest, I suggest the Midnight Marauder. If you, you, know, you want to get like, you know, deep down and dirty in King Street, then I suggest this one on the... Uh... <laughs> but like, the point is, right, it, it, and the interesting thing about these is they're, they're, they're produced from OSM, or OpenStreetMap, so, so they're basically using this open data format. Um, they've basically tiled it, and you can tailor the tiles on demand. So you've got this kind of... The best of both worlds, we've got tiles, we can deliver the tiles very, very quickly, and we can change the tiles, so we've got a bit of the a la carte world. And what both of these things do is provide you with a context. They provide you with something that then you can put stuff on top of. Right. So, yeah, as Simon says, we've got we've got this context, the base map that we um, that we're displaying on the screen, but it's not of much use to an end user. And so, as iOS developers, what we generally do is is drop maps on here. And here's a, here's uh, Matt Tui's app, the breakfast out. I don't know. Matt is, is Matt here tonight? I don't know. He demoed it. Services. Yeah, right. So he, he demoed this app uh, a few months back, um, where I'm standing here, and I think this is a really good example of of um, points points on a map, uh, basically showing he's he's gone to the trouble of symbolising these to relate those to the to the details below, and so it's a fantastic um, representation of of uh, points. So what if we want to go beyond that, though? And this is the world that, that Simon and I are often living in with the, the types of clients that we're working with. And, um, and you, so what about lines and polygons? And you might sort of say, well, we're, we're only ever going to deal with points. But the fact is that there's actually, um, with uh, the Victorian government recently, the, the, the image on the left there, the, um, the data with Gov, .au is, is basically the Victorian government's released a lot of their spatial data um, available for, or for use by anybody. Um, and so one of, the, one of the common uses of this might be, for example, the fact that on the Apple Maps, of course, uh, famously they've removed property boundaries. Um, this sort of, um, these, these, this information is now available um, under the DataVicGov AU website, so you can download this information. And if you know what you're doing, you can process this and display this on your on your app as an overlay. Um, so we've we've traditionally worked with a range of formats for things like this KML, um, GeoJSON. You might have heard of as well. And um, there's some interesting developments in this in this space. The image on the right is actually hard to read, but it's it's a relatively new library called TopoJSON. Uh, which is dealing with some of the issues around uh, the the volume of of data that um, that these formats can can result in. So just staying on like the idea of delivering spatial data. So generally, spatial data is quite big, um, and when you're sending it over the wire, 
and you're sending quite a bit of it and you're dealing with lines and you're dealing with polygons, then you've got to try and try and deal with the idea of the, or the problem of size. And Torpo.js is a great library for doing it. it. It's not very, it doesn't show very well, but this is, this is, it, it, oh, you can't sort of see the lines. So w w it, t topology from a, from a GIS, it's a very, very old school GIS concept of the way of modeling data. And you model data based upon shared arcs. So you don't sort of the idea of a, a single discrete polygon. You don't have that. A polygon is made up of, mul of multiple arcs, and where you've got adjoining polygons, those arcs are shared. Okay, so it's kind of like a mesh. Now, what's interesting about it is it, it dramatically reduces the, the the size of data going over the wire. So this is a great example. Um, of this guy that basically took, um, I think this is municipalities in Norway, and um, so he took it in a traditional GIS format. He converted it to GeoJSON, which is now like you know a fairly well used uh, format for delivering spatial content on the web, and then he converted it to TopoJSON, and you can see the you know the size difference. Same map, same polygons, same end user experience in terms of getting those polygons down on the client. You know that you can then have interactivity with those polygons. That's great, but you know dramatically, dramatically more, uh, <coughs> dramatic size reduction. Right. So today we've been talking about um, spatial data and spatial data delivery, but there's some interesting things happening uh, in terms of cloud services and things like that that are accessible to all of us as developers in terms of spatial, um, other spatial technologies delivered on the web. So this, for example, is an image generated out of a service called CardoDB, which, is a, which comes out of uh, originally Spain, but these guys have got an office in New York, and um, we're, we're partners with these guys here in Australia delivering on their platform. And so... What's interesting about this is these guys are basically take this image is generated from taking points, which are basically like height measurements. Um, some some analyst has generated um, contour lines from these, and so this is what in Iceland or something. I think. Yeah, Iceland. Yeah. So um, and then what they've done is basically symbolised or styled the map um, based on the height of the area, and so we can see these really hot areas up in the mountainous area, and so it really tells a story, but it's an amazing sort of um, image as well, and so we can generate all this using a relatively, you know, inexpensive service now, um, and these are delivered as tiles and can be displayed in your own app. So I guess the point is, you know, consider going beyond just displaying the Apple base map layer or um, or you know the Google Maps um, layers in your in your application to really tell a story with that spatial data. Um, he's looking moody, isn't he? Isn't he? <laughs> he always looks moody, doesn't he? Yeah. Do, do you know who this guy is? Like you know John Snow. I'm not to talk. I'm not going to talk about this John Snow. I'm going to talk about another. Like, you know, like, right, so it's because of spatial data, you know, you think about it as table, like, you know, X and Y column, and you think about relationships, your primary key, foreign key. But of course, the power of spatial data is you're making those relationships not on primary key, foreign key, but about, you know, does this thing touch this thing? Am I within that thing? How close am I to that thing? And it all comes down to Jon Snow, in a way, but not that Jon Snow. Um, it comes down to a guy that produced this map. His name was also Jon Snow. He's a bit older. And uh, he was like mid nineteenth, you know, mid nineteenth century dude, right? Like spatial, uh, not spatial. He wasn't really a spatial dude. He was like a scientist. Anyway, he 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 was sort of researching cholera, the spread of cholera. And what he wanted to do was uh, map the incident of cholera. Um, and he was doing an experiment in the uh, east end of London, or I think it was east end of London. And his map, his original map, was on the left hand side. So he basically plotted the incidents of cholera and he stacked them up. So you can see there, you know, there's a lot of cholera, and he and he used a very very simple symbology to basically say that there's a lot of cholera in that area. And from that very very simple process of associating the correlation between events spatially, he was able to build up a hypothesis to say, well, hang on, what, what what's going on in that area that 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 could be connected to this high incident of cholera? And he made a hypothesis that said it was something to do with the water pump in a street called Broad Street. And that led to the discovery that cholera was, in fact, a waterborne disease. So John Snow is quite an important person, not just from a spatial point of view, but you know, from a medical 
point of view. Um, in a way, he's like the father of GIS. Um, and on the uh, right-hand side is a Carto DB representation of John Snow's earlier earlier map. And it's just using different sort of, it's using a, a, a clustering algorithm to basically, and you've probably used clustering algorithms, uh, but to show the same thing that John Snow was earlier trying to show. So this idea of spatial uh, cor correlation and also just analyzing the data that you've got, not just basically drawing the data, but analyzing the data that you've got. Right. Here's another sort of implementation of spatial analysis, and this is a, a project we've developed actually. This is an iPad app that we've developed um, in combination with a company called AGI in the States. And these guys primarily do sort of hardcore simulation software. They've got clients like um, NASA and, and Defence both here in Australia and in, in, in the US. And what this is showing is the propagation of radio communications um, from an antenna. Um, to a handheld radio that might be used by, for example, in this case, um, like emergency services people. And so what we're, we're, what we're trying to show here is if I put an antenna sort of at that, that dot, you can just see just, just, uh, beyond, just above the centre of the, the map there. Uh, if I pop an antenna there, what sort of coverage am I going to see? And so you can see it's a really simple representation of that very complex process. And so what's actually happening here when we drop that dot, we send a, a message off to AGI and these guys basically process all the contour information for that area. They look at the signal strength of that, that radio and uh, basically on the basis of that and uh, the information we get back, we can say, well, these green areas, that's where you're going to actually get re reasonable communications in, um, in the yellow areas there. They're sort of so-so and then red, uh, well... And then, and then the areas where we've got no no symbology at all, you're, you're basically out of out of comms range. So um, this is a really interesting map in terms of just just helping those types of um, uh, people. And, and we're we're able to generate those, this in real time now using using modern day technology. Um, just just finally on this sort of idea of. You know, analyzing and visualizing data. So this is another great example. It was developed by GE and iPad app. I don't know if you've seen it. it was, this is a couple of years old. Stats of the Union basically took took a whole load of statistics data from the US, and whilst they did the an analysis offline, they basically shipped the results of the analysis down to like or, or shipped it with the app. Um, and it's a great example of superb design, superb cartography to basically t tell tell a story really simply um, you know so it's not complex cartography you've just got two two simple colors telling us that where the distribution of um, a population cohort is in the in the US it's a really really nice piece of piece of design but it's based upon spatial analysis that's, that's happened offline right so you and you know, what about when we're not on the web? And, the, you know, hands up who's been asked by a client, well, you know, what what if I'm out of, you know, comms, comms range or whatever, you know? Like, it's a very common question for for people to have to deal with in mobile development. And it's and it's a hard nut to crack for, for spatial as well. And so um, there's a couple of solutions um, emerging in this particular area, and there's a range of formats um, that, that you can consider. Um, one that's gained quite a bit of traction in recent times is a, is a format called MB Tiles, and this is from the Mapbox um, company that, that Simon mentioned earlier. So these guys basically take a SQLite database, take all the tiles and save, save those tiles into a SQLite database using a, an open um, domain format. <coughs> This format can be read and written to via a range of open spatial data tools. And uh, these guys also provide their own extension to a, an iOS um, SDK called uh, RouteMe. So they, these guys basically are built on top of RouteMe to provide some additional capabilities. Um, and so you can download Mapbox um, SDK as a, as a separate runtime and, and achieve this sort of offline capability um, using tiles, and, th and that gives you basically the, back, the base map offline. Here's an example of the, the use of the Mapbox SDK. In this example, it's offline, 
um, the tiles here have been cut custom. So basically use different pieces of software to create from OpenStreetMap a custom set of tiles, package those tiles in MB tiles format and, and, and ship it to the device. Um, and the data on top of here is, is um, vector data, if you like. It's point data and it's supplied in GeoJSON format. This is just boozers in, in Melbourne. My boozer in Melbourne app. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and just the, map, the Mapbox SDK has got a nice clustering algorithm so I can see where the most boozers are and I can concentrate my efforts in, in that area. Um, so if you're not, you know, if you're not used the SDK, I, I encourage you to t take a look. Right, so that's point data that Simon's shown, but we, like I said earlier, we're dealing a lot um, in, our, in our area with line and, and polygon type data as well and so here's a here's another app that we built and um, you know a call out to the um, to the domestic cat guys that helped us with this this app as well and so this is an app we built for one of the NBN contractors and so um, what we're showing here is actually um, some offline spatial data so you can see the base map faintly in the background there showing sort of the roads and uh, property boundaries but then on top of that, we're drawing these line, um, these these lines, and uh, and that's actually routes in the in the NBN. So these are basically trenches where they lay, where they've got um, ducts which which have cables in. And so there's a number of areas the, these this contractor are working in where there's no network coverage, and so they they need this information offline. Now, um, one thing to say here is that in the in this particular case, all they needed to do was select these lines. And, uh, and basically they wanted to associate um, with some, a piece of information with a, with a feature shown on the map, so they wanted to be able to tap on these. One of the interesting challenges going forward for this space is how do we take this information in and make it editable as well? And there's some simple ways of doing it. Obviously with points, it's relatively straightforward. Um, but there's a, there's a complex problem not just around sort of... Um, yeah, um, editing and, and, and processing these these features and pushing these back back to a, a, a server, but also interacting with these things. If you imagine, you know, providing a, a touch-based interface for interacting with these things, it's a relatively interesting and complex sort of UI problem. And so that's something we're we're sort of working through. And um, yeah, happy to hear uh, hear um, good ideas on if um, if people have got. Um, if people have got them. So that's basically all we wanted to cover today, so please follow us on Twitter. And if, you've, if you're interested in this area and you've got interesting use cases for this sort of space, this is the area we're playing in, and this was really meant to be an introduction to this sort of domain and the sort of things that are possible. So please follow us on Twitter if you're not already and send any uh, questions you might have to this. But um, any questions? Brilliant. Take that as a... No, like that. Oh, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> so it's it's, it's semi-related. So you guys are doing geospatial stuff on projections of the actual world. How does that how does that kind of cartography relate to doing logical maps that people would read and look at and understand at, say, a network, of a train network or something that doesn't actually oh, right, yeah. exist in that format? So like the but tube map, the, the, the tube map is a, yeah. the classic example, right? Is, it, is that a similar field, or is that a sort of completely different thing? Well, it's, inter it's, it's, it's interesting in, in, in the use case that like Scott was talking about with the NBN, for example. There's a point where the logical, the, the sort of the view of the world, the natural view of the world, becomes problematic, and they want to then look at this sort of you know, deeper terrain view of the world and explore things that you can't physically get to. So there is a sort of crossover point. Um, I don't think in, in, in our world we're, we're dealing with the... Uh, we haven't done any sort of design pieces to abstract, you know, classical mapping to that, 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 that tube world, which, is, you know, is a really interesting area. But um, I've, seen, I've seen certain cases where it's being done. Yeah. Some, of those, some of those old maps of particular big infrastructure things yeah. are quite famous. Yeah, because you know someone's worked out a nice way to display. Yeah, exactly. yeah, de definitely, yeah. definitely. But it's interesting now how easy it is to display anything on the world rather yeah. than just a small section. I mean, it, like a, a lot of the, it, I think a lot of the challenges we're seeing is things where you've got a higher volume of data, mm. 
and you're trying to sort of get that volume of data over on a classical map. So using techniques like like clustering, you've seen clustering and, and also things like hex binning where you basically create like hexagonal boxes which then basically you have an associated volume of data and a classification like a colour which is applied to this hexagonal thing and it gives a, it gives a very very clear concept of density so if you've got a high volume of data, how do you get across that idea of density? I mean, even even things like, um, in a way, if you look at like you know things like graph databases and 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 exploring those you know m that massive amount of data, they're essentially coming up with maps as a way to visualise that huge amount of data and look at things in that manner. It's a really interesting area, you know. It's. Sorry, like, uh, we have an app where it's for chauffeurs to go uh, to plot out routes, like to place A to place B. Yeah. And then we want to find out whether they have crossed the zone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard with Google Maps API and stuff like that, where we can't really actually say whether they whether the route actually covered a zone or not. Mm -hmm. Is it something that's possible with the uh, Geoplex uh, SDK? I mean, we don't we don't have an SDK, but 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 you know, it's a very very simple use case in a, in a GIS context to understand. It's a classical spatial relationship. You know, have I in, do I intersect with you? Um, there's various options to to solve that problem. It, it's not. No, it's not well, like for example, if I do have a Google route, can I find whether it's been zoned? Uh, if I have a zone. Geospatial zone, can I find uh, if, the, if the road has crossed the zone or not? Yeah. We'll, yeah. Have a, we'll have a check during yeah. the break, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just, just wondering where it's going with um, <coughs> where you talk about tiles and other image tiles, or is it going towards vector? Based yeah, based like, or? well, Mapbox have developed a vector tile format based on protobuf. Um, and so their, their most recent implementation of TileMill, which is essentially a, 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 um, an application that allows you to take the raw spatial data and do the cart cartography piece and then cut the tiles using a library called Mapnik. They've basically decided that these all, in a way they've decided that these old school spatial data formats are crap. So what they do is they take those old school formats, convert it to their new vector tile format, and then they're in control of the renderer and the format, so they make the experience of basically doing the render and the tile cutting much quicker. So I think essentially it is it, it is going that way. Um, is that rendering on device the, in the vector format? Like I mean, you know, Apple Maps and Google Maps now, you know, yeah, totally yeah. vector oriented, so you can yeah. you know, rotate them or skew them in a variety of ways. Yeah. You still get a nice clean. Yeah, yeah. No, in this case, it's purely about basically, um, or in this example, it's just a purely an app to to generate the tile, to generate the image tile. So it comes down as an image. It still would come down in that in that particular use case. It would still come down as an image. Yeah. Yeah. But do you, just quickly on that on the vector data, like for example, with the uh, the MBN contractor there, that they're all vectors, local, mm. so they're rendered geojson vectors essentially. Uh, the tile case in that case is actually, um, or the, yeah, their tiles underneath is the base map, and so that's that's pretty much the the common scenario for this sort of custom mapping at the moment. But um, yeah, it's moving more towards that, and it's really just access to data and tool kits for one implementing of, that. One of the challenges I guess we find is like our client base wants us to to honour honour relationships and honour behaviour of spatial data vector spatial data client side. So if you deliver that, it's say something like GeoJSON, yes, you can display it vector, but when you when you move a polygon, the other polygons don't move with it. Or when you move, an, if you can imagine a network is topologically connected, when you move that node, you know, all the cables that are connected to that node are meant to move with it. And some of those are the, the sort of challenges that we're finding is, is doing the things that are very, fairly straightforward in the classical GIS world down on a down on a device. I mean, I see it as one of the, the complexities of the vector data generally is, just, is the rendering of the yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Like on, you know, in MapKit on iOS, you, you, know, you can draw polygons and lines and, and a variety of other things, but um, you're sort of limited to using uh, core graphics to do that. So right. it's all happening, say, on the CPU, whereas yeah. 
you know, if you're getting really complicated map data, um, you really want that to be more like, really like a game, like you, you want that to be sending vectors to the GPU to say, hey, here's some polygons and I'm drawing um, those yep. on the GPU rather than mm -hmm. the CPU. And then how do you then tile that? Like, well, how do you slice that information? It's like, it's like taking a really complicated like CAT scan or something and then chopping it up into small pieces so that you can actually uh, render it efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just displaying the, the features that the, should be in that in that box. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. No, they, they, it's well, exactly the problem. We, that's the, exactly the problems we're we're loading a lot into the asking the asking the SDK to render a lot unnecessarily. Essentially, to oh. yeah, it's pain in the ass. Chris, yeah. well, taking that question one dimension further, yeah. a lot of the all the consumer mapping guys are doing three D projections of, of mapping now with yeah. buildings as well as topography. Is that the sort of data that you've guys have to deal with you? Yeah, we're not, we're not seeing a lot. I mean, there's certainly a lot of 3D data. There's, you know, you go to the vendor presentations and whatever in, in you know, the hardcore vendors in this sort of space, there, there is always a 3D demo in there and, you know, obviously they need to be sort of competing with Google and Apple in that sort of space, but there's not a lot of openness to that data at the moment and it's expensive, my understanding is, it yeah. is expensive to collect um, so and and maintain, you know, because it's it's one thing to fly at once, for example, and and capture that, but then um, and and I you know I think this is why you know Apple's data to date has has been a bit you know um, iffy is is this is spatial data is is hard to obtain at a you know cost effective um, yeah. yeah in a cost effective manner, but um, but it's certainly I mean it's yeah it's certainly happening and um, yeah they. The more open the data is, the more you know people like yourself, for example, can can start to do this. And uh, but yeah, I'd encourage people to sort of not um, to to you know think about what's what could be achieved in this area as well. And you, you yeah. mentioned that the like state government um, yeah. governments opening up all of their data. Yeah. Um, is that happening kind of broadly? Like I was reminded that I saw something on like Catalyst or something on ABC yeah. where. Like CSIRO have been mapping the seabed um, around Australia, and it's, I mean, they've a fraction of what is the actual seabed, but you know, that, yeah. that information is obviously of great use to scientists. Um, but is that like common that, you know, state or, government or national government data is just becoming put up, put up on the web for free access? Yeah, yeah, go I on. think it's, it's, unfortunately, it's variable, and um, I think. Uh, in some ways, like, like the Guardian basically led a campaign in the UK to open up the, some of the data that Ordnance Survey had been hanging on under the premise that Ordnance Survey, which, which is the national mapping agency in the, in the UK, was sort of taxpayer funded and this was, you know, basically family silver that we couldn't get access to. So I think that's changed the game a little bit and the Ordnance Survey have come on board and they've done some interesting projects with linked data and some other interesting initiatives to make their gold available to all. So I think on the back of that, we, we're seeing this trend of, uh, but in Australia, for example, you know, there's certain states that aren't as proactive as, so Queen, as to, to my knowledge, Queensland and Victoria are the only states where they've, they've actually got a proper initiative going on, but there's, Matty, can you, do you know? Australia's getting close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not sure about the others. But yeah. it, it tends to really depend on the government data set that you're after. Mm. Not just spatial data, but all open government data. A lot of the time it comes down to the department is unwilling mm. to release that data or unable to put in the effort necessary to clean that data up for mm. public consumption. The other big ones, Geoscience Australia, who are federal, they've yeah. released all their stuff. Yeah, so, uh, Even with the, the US has had a yeah, public, data public. Yeah, you bang on like you, even if you go on like that 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 site that Scott showed the the variety of like quality yeah. and what you actually get is yeah I've made I've presented it like <laughs> you just go in there you know type in property boundaries and yeah I mean you, you probably get you, you probably get that in a half decent format but you know like I, I, they've they've got you've got, they've got entries registered on that site I think one of them is for. Um, Train stations, right? You know, like train stations in Victoria or something like that. And it just redirects to like a, a, a PTV page, which is about you know customer feedback. <laughs> so there's actually no data available at all; just a redirection to some dodgy PTV page. You know, it's shit house. So.
So I think it's a big. Well, on the flip side of that, people like Big Brother have released the whole, like you say, the whole goal. Yeah, whole yeah, yeah. So it's very variable. Yeah. Wrap it up there. Yep. yep. Cool. Excellent. Thanks, guys.